So I'm going to get us uh, kicked off here. And our first speaker and our keynote needs no introduction, but I will give you one anyways. John Kempf is the founder of Advancing Eco Agriculture, a plant nutrition and biostimulants consulting company. A top expert in the field of biological and regenerative farming, John founded AEA in 2006 to help fellow farmers by providing the education, tools, and strategies that will have a global effect on the food supply and those who are growing, growing that supply. Uh, this morning, he is here to kick us off with some words of inspiration the way only he knows how. Please welcome John. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. I hope you are all having an awesome day and preparing for an exhilarating growing season coming up. So we have 15 minutes to uh, for a keynote, and I have some things to discuss that are really important to me, and um, I believe to all of us. And what I want us to begin thinking about is what is what do we want the regenerative agriculture landscape to look like? over the course of the next five to 10 years. Whatever it is that we want it to look like, we will have to define that and create that in the next six to 12 months. Because as all of you are very well aware, the narrative is rapidly evolving. The players who are entering into the space are rapidly evolving uh, and growing. And I believe this is really valuable and it's really beneficial. It's the future that we want to create but we are responsible for guiding it. And so uh, what we see happening, well, if to offer some context, going back um, roughly six or seven years ago, there was Walmart announced that they were going to begin uh, distributing organic fruits and vegetables and other organic foods in significant amounts. And this produced a lot of outrage in certain sectors of the organic agricultural community. And I didn't understand the outrage. I mean, on one level, I kind of understand it that the, the ethos, the inherent ethos of organic agriculture, of caring for the landscape, of being good stewards, is not particularly the ethos that is associated with Walmart. And so I understand that ethos conflict. On the other hand, if we truly desire to change landscapes on a significant scale, then we should embrace the idea of Walmart distributing organic food products on scale enthusiastically because we want to see significant market penetration. We are on a similar threshold with regenerative agriculture. As of right now, there is no universally accepted definition of regenerative agriculture. And I used to be of the opinion that this is a good thing. And I've been in the process over the course of the last six months or so, I've been in the process of changing my opinion with additional information. I used to be of the opinion that uh, a regenerative agriculture verification or certification is a problem because when we look at the pattern of what happened with the organic agriculture certification, it automatically created an us versus them, an in-group and an out-group. And that polarization is at least part of the uh, effect, or that the effect of that polarization is, bears part of the responsibility for organic certification not gaining more rapid accept, uh, acceptance. And so I have a concern about regenerative verification accomplishing something similar. And I also have a concern about um, regenerative verification being process oriented rather than outcome oriented. And I have a concern about it not being inclusive of where people are in the journey. So those are all things that we need to think through and um, come to good solutions where we can really include people at different stages of the journey and celebrate that journey rather than celebrating a destination, because after all, that's what regeneration is all about. However, within all of that context, um, so I've, I've been in the process of revising my perspective on the possible value of regenerative verification, but I believe that we are missing context and the recently the five principles of soil health were updated to the six principles context was added and yet in this conversation 
it strikes me that we are missing context exactly around what used to be called the five principles. So going back 15 years ago, a group of innovators within the USDA and um, within uh, and a group of farmers developed what were known as the five principles of soil health. And you know what they are, not tilling, not disturbing the soil, um, keeping the soil covered, living roots, lives, integrating livestock, etc. And then more recently, they were updated and a sixth element uh, of, of context was added. And then they were known as the sixth principles of soil health. And then those six principles of soil health were rebranded and are now called the six principles of regenerative agriculture. And that's a problem as far as I'm concerned. The reason that is a problem is because it defines regenerative agriculture only in terms of improving soil health. And this is a very seductive um, approach. It's seductive because soil health is the underlying common denominator for many of the ecosystem benefits and the ecosystem services that we want to create and that we want to see becoming established on significant scale with the adoption of regenerative agriculture. Soil health is at the foundation of, of um, sequestering carbon dioxide, storing it as um, stable organic matter, regenerating local hydrological cycles, um, regenerating local landscapes and local ecosystems. Soil health is the common denominator that lies underneath all of that. But regenerative agriculture needs to be about more than just restoring local landscapes and ecosystems. I would propose that there are two fundamental pieces, two macro pieces that are missing from this conversation. One of them is that regenerative agriculture should be not just about restoring um, soil health and landscape and ecosystem health, but also about public health, the health of you, your family, your neighbors, the people in your community, and the people in our macro community. When we look at this from a biblical perspective of and the directive to be our brother's keeper, are we really our brother's keeper when our brothers and the people that we're supplying food to are consuming food that is making them sick. So we need to have a conversation, not just about regenerative agriculture and putting a neat boundary around agriculture as being exclu exclusive to farms, but we also need to have a conversation about regenerating public health because agriculture is a significant stakeholder in that conversation. And it's really interesting. We want to have conversations or that we have this popular marketing slogan of agriculture needs to feed the world. But as soon as we want to have a conversation about what the responsibility means of feeding the world and are we feeding the world a healthy diet and healthy, high quality food that can make people well rather than ill, then all of a sudden we want to shift responsibility. No, that's not food's responsibility. That's the responsibility of the medical system the healthcare system, or I should say the sick care system. So that's one aspect. We need to have conversations around what does it mean when we have, when we produce crops that have nutritional integrity. I'm specifically using that phrase. I'm not using the phrase, phrase nutrient density. I'm saying nutritional integrity. When we have foods that have nutritional integrity and they transfer that nutritional integrity and, and their immune function to the livestock and to the people who consume that food, what is the collective impact on our collective public health and on our individual health? This is perhaps something that regenerative agriculture verification needs to grow into in the future because we still need a lot of information and a lot of data, but we already know enough that we need to include this as one of the elements that we aspire to. The second piece that we need to include in the regenerative agriculture verification is, in my opinion, even bigger and more important and more immediate than the need to include public health. And I would describe this as uh, regenerating the capacity for stewardship. So when I use the words regenerating the capacity for stewardship, I am describing, um, and I, I could, go into some detail about uh, my thought process around the economics, but let's just say it this way. Uh, there are two 
very different points of view, philosophical points of view about the role of humans in the landscape. The one point of view that is held by many environmentalists and uh, people with a rewilding point of view is to suggest that humans are the plague. Humans are a pest. And the best way to regenerate landscapes is to remove humans from the landscape. The other point of view is that humans are here to be stewards and that we are the ultimate keystone species. We are a super keystone species and that we have the capacity to influence and guide and shape all other keystone species. And in fact, it is having loving, caring stewards and humans in the landscape is the fastest way to regenerate ecosystems and the fastest way to restore our planet's health. These are two very different points of view. I, of course, and I believe many of you as well, subscribe to the second point of view, that humans are the ultimate keystone species. And this means if we want to regenerate landscapes, we need to have more caring people as stewards in the ecosystem, not fewer. We need to have more. But in order to have more people in the landscape, there has to be an economic incentive. There has to be an economic wherewithal for them to be in the landscape. So when we talk about regenerating agriculture and regenerating ecosystems, we also need to regenerate the capacity for stewardship. In plain and simple language, that means we need more money flowing into rural landscapes. We need to revitalize rural economies and we need to revitalize farming communities with more money flowing into farming communities. So what this means is uh, right now, regenerative agriculture is defined in terms of regenerating farmland, regenerating soil health. That's the nexus of the conversation is regenerating soil health. And to achieve that, there are different regenerative verifications that are emerging um, now, and others are still being developed. There are several in the marketplace right now, but they put 100% of the responsibility on the farmer. The farmer bears the cost of getting the certification and verification. The farmer bears the cost of implementation and the farmer bears the cost. The farmer bears all the responsibility and all the costs. This is a problem. This does not take into consideration the relationships of the supply chain. So there's another aspect um, that I would like to, I'll, I'll mention it as well. I know that I'm running up on time here, but um, regeneration at its most fundamental level is fundamentally about regenerating relationships. When we, we can regenerate relationships between plants and soil microbes or between livestock and the landscape or between humans and their responsibility as stewards of that landscape. And then there's also the relationships between the farmers, the producers, and the supply chain. What might it look like when we have regenerative supply chain relationships instead of extractive relationships? To the, the summary of my point, and I'll continue to elaborate on this a bit uh, further, but I'm going to give you the headline now. The headline is, we do not need regenerative verified farms. We need regenerative verified supply chains. The pressure, the responsibility should not rest exclusively on the farmers. The pressure should, should be brought to bear on the supply chains. It is the supply chains. It is the CPG companies, the ConAgris, the General Mills of the world that need to bear the responsibility of regenerative verification. They need to become regenerative verified and they need to not just to bear the fiscal and the financial responsibility, but a part of the regenerative verification process needs to be them verifying that they are transferring a, you, I'll use the term fair trade, a fair trade amount of money back into rural landscapes. In other words, they are regenerating the capacity for stewardship. The, they need to bear responsibility, not just the farmers themselves. If that is not the case, this will simply become another extractive relationship. And there's one example that I know of 
where this type of relationship functions beautifully. This example is six or seven years old, uh, but was when I became aware of it and I haven't had any recent updates. But in uh, the small country of the Netherlands, there are three organizations that have an incredible relationship. One of them is Albert Hain, which has all of the corner grocery, fruit and vegetable stands and produce stands where people do their shopping every day to have food for the next day or two on their way back and forth from work. They have a very different food culture than we do here. Um, so we have Albert Hain. Albert Hain has 60 to 70% of the total supply chain of fruits and vegetables in the Netherlands um, at the time when I was there. Then uh, we have another organization called Bakker, which has the distribution and processing facilities network all across the country. And then we have farmers. These three organizations all work in very close collaboration and very transparently. All of their books and finances are open to anyone else in those organizations. So there's complete price transparency and margin transparency across all organizations. None of those organizations have buyers and none of them have sellers. The farmers set the prices and the sales discounts that will occur at, on Albert Haynes retail shelves. So this is an example of what a regenerative supply chain might look like. We need to have similar regenerative supply chains and we need to have, when as this conversation about develop, developing regenerative verifications uh, develops here in North America and around the world, we need to make certain that the, the burden of responsibility does not fall exclusive on farmers, but that we need to have regenerative supply chains and not just regenerative soil. So this is something that's really important. And I wanted to discuss it with you because the time for us to have this conversation is now. If we don't own this conversation and as farmers step forward, take ownership and bring our voice to the conversation, guess what's going to happen? Other people in the space will define for us what they believe regenerative agriculture should be. And there's a very high probability that if that is the case, we will end up once more with an extractive relationship between the supply chain and producers rather than a regenerative relationship between people who eat food and people who grow food. Those are two very different things. So those conclude my thoughts. I want to say thank you to all of you for coming to Regen Rev. I hope you find the, I'm sure you're going to find the coming uh, presentations to be inspirational and insightful. Thank you for being here. And um, I look forward to speaking with all of you and chatting with all of you in various discussion forums. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, John. I love that so much. Thank you for challenging us to think about uh, the regeneration of public health and stewardship, stewardship capacity. That's a mouthful. And um, the critical importance of regenerative supply chains. All really good points for us to think about as we proceed today.